Dr. Madison, Madison Miller is a 2023 Canals Marine Policy Fellow working jointly with the National Sea Grant Office and NOAA's Marine Debris Program. Madison's work supports the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act activities across both offices to enhance coordination and communication between the teams concerning marine debris related projects. Madison completed her PhD in 2022 at the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Biological Sciences, where she used stable isotope analysis to investigate the long-term effects of overfishing on marine food webs. Thanks, Brianna. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Madison Willard. I'm a CNAS fellow in both the National Sea Grant Office and the Marine Debris Program. Thank you for coming to my Lunch and Learn talk. Um, the title of my talk is Historic Trophic Decline in New England's Coastal Marine Ecosystem, and this is some of the work that I did during my PhD at Georgia Tech. So um, I'm going to go through a quick outline of my talk first. So I'm going to focus on this concept that my PhD really centered on, which is food web flattening in the Anthropocene. I'm going to tell you about the effects of formalin preservation on carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes of seaweeds, which is a method that I validated to use um, museum, museum preserved seaweeds to look at food webs back in time. Um, I'll then talk about how I used that method to look at the historic trophic decline in New England's coastal marine ecosystem. And then if there's time, I'll tell you a bit about a side project I did where I applied stable isotopes to look at shark uh, diet and spatial use. So human-caused stressors such as habitat modification, overfishing, and species introductions change not only how much animals eat, but also what they eat. In other words, we're changing the very structure of food webs, and this has implications for species health and ecosystem resilience. This is a really nice diagram that I think illustrates the concept of food web simplification. It's from Jeremy Jackson's 2001 paper. Um, on the left-hand side is a depiction of a complex coral reef food web. So you can see there's a lot of predators on top. Um, there's really thick arrows, which delineates strong species interactions. And then on the right hand side, there is a simplified coral reef food web. So people are at the top instead of natural predators. And a lot of those arrows have gotten thinner, which shows that those interactions between species are weaker. So why does this matter? Um, diminished food web linkages, complexity, and connectance makes communities less stable and less resilient in the face of further species loss. So what can we do overall? Um, we can focus on restoring food web interactions or trophic restoration. So sometimes the removal of introduced species can be feasible and can restore trophic interactions. Or sometimes we can reintroduce or protect predators where overexploitation has occurred. Overall, I would argue that we need a better understanding of food webs and species interactions. The structure of food webs is an important indicator of human impacts on the system. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about the effects of formalin preservation on carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes of seaweeds. But before I get into that, I just want to give a little background on stable isotopes for those who are unfamiliar. So isotopes are atoms with the same numbers of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. So they have different masses, different physical properties, and stable isotopes are non-radioactive and they're naturally occurring in the environment. Um, scientists use many different kinds of stable isotopes to study natural systems and processes. And some of the most popular ones are oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and sulfur. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on nitrogen stable isotopes. So delta N15 just refers to the ratio of nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14. Delta N15 is really valuable because it reveals information about marine pollution, animals, diets, habitats, and more. So here's a depiction of a basic food web. You have producers at the bottom, primary consumers eating the producers, secondary consumers eating the primary consumers, and then tertiary consumers. So as you go up in a food web from primary to tertiary consumers, those animals get enriched in delta N15. So you can tell where an animal is in the food web based on the delta N15 signature in its tissues. 
All right, I'll talk a little bit about why seaweeds are important in a second, but I just wanted to tell you about my materials and methods really quick. So um, when I'm looking at stable isotopes in seaweeds, I just dry the seaweeds, I homogenize them until they're a fine powder, and then I analyze them for nitrogen and carbon stable isotopes in a mass spectrometer. And I want to emphasize here that I think museums are an untapped treasure trove of information about animals' diets, habitats, and food webs of the past. Okay, so stable isotope analysis of delta N15 and delta C13 in seaweeds is useful for setting a nutrient baseline in food web studies and for evaluating environmental contamination. So by nutrient baseline, what I mean by that is that sometimes in the water column, the ambient delta N15 can get distorted by things like nutrient runoff or pollution. So when we're looking at the trophic position of a fish, we need to incorporate a nutrient baseline to measure that. <clears throat> so here's the equation that we use when we're calculating that trophic position. So we take the difference between the delta N15 of the fish and the delta N15 of the baseline, which in this case is seaweeds, we divide that by the trophic enrichment factor, which is 3.4, and that's just the percent amount that fish increase in their delta N15 with each step of a food web. And then we add to that the trophic position of the baseline, so seaweeds, their value is one. So we just add one, and then that's how you calculate um, the trophic position of a fish, which is how high in a food web a fish is. Okay. So we have seaweed specimens in herbaria collections, um, and they were collected over the past 200 or more years, but many of these specimens have been exposed to formalin, which is the most common fixative in museums. At the start of this study, we didn't know whether formalin would affect the nitrogen and carbon stable isotope values in seaweeds, so we didn't know whether these herbaria collections could be used for studies of historical trophic ecology, but we did know these values would be very useful um, if we could use them. So my research question here was, what are the effects of formalin on macroalgal and cyanobacterial delta N15 and delta C13? So to answer this question, I sampled seaweeds that had been in formalin for four to five years or 50 days, and this was to detect whether there's an effect of time spent in formalin. I sampled across the three seaweed phyla, so ochrophyta, which are brown seaweeds, chlorophyta, which are green seaweeds, and rhodophyta, which are red seaweeds. And then I also, just for fun, added limba, which is a genus of cyanobacteria. So I took each seaweed, I split it in half, and then half of it was exposed to formalin and half of it was dried without any chemicals. Overall, we had 41 pairs of formalin versus dried for delta C13 and 27 pairs of formalin versus dried for delta N15. <clears throat> um, the nitrogen number is lower because some sea seaweeds are naturally low in nitrogen and some samples did not have enough nitrogen to give reliable readings, so we had to lower the sample size. So I found that paired through pair t-tests, um, they showed no significant effects of formalin on delta N15 or delta C13 values in seaweeds generally. But an ANOVA found that there were differential effects of formalin on delta C13 values across the macroalgal phyta. So I found that ochrophyta or brown seaweeds are significantly lowered by 0.2% um, upon exposure to formalin. So overall, I found that time spent in formalin does not alter seaweed delta N15 or delta C13, and formalin does not alter seaweed delta N15 in general. But I did find that formalin lowered seaweed delta C13 in the phylum Ochrophyta, um, which was lowered by 0.2%. So overall, formalin preserved seaweeds are reliable for nitrogen stable isotope analysis. And we found that carbon stable isotopes are less reliable for formalin preserved seaweeds, but they may still be used provided there's a large sample size to overcome that variability that we found. If only seaweeds from the phylum Ochrophyta are available, we recommend using a correction factor of 0.2%. So overall, preserved seaweeds can and should be used for studies of historical trophic ecology. I published this research in Limnology and Oceanography Methods. If you are interested in getting a PDF, just email me afterwards and I can send that to you.
Okay. Um, now I'm going to talk about a time that I used that method that I validated to look at historic trophic decline in New England's coastal marine ecosystem. So overfishing alters predator-prey dynamics and marine ecosystems. And in Massachusetts, physically destructive fishing started in 1900 and fleet effort has remained at its highest level since the 1970s. This reduces colonial epifauna, benthic megafauna, and community diversity and productivity. So with all of these changes going on, I wondered how do you assess these food web shifts in coastal New England? So we know that stable isotope analysis is a powerful tool to measure changes in animals' trophic ecology. So the delta N15, like I've mentioned, in animal tissue increases with the animal's trophic position. Um, previous studies have found that formalin has only a minimal effect on fish delta N15 values, which means that museum fish are definitely fair game to look at how food webs have changed over time. So remember this graphic I showed you earlier with um, increasing delta N15 with uh, steps in a food web. I just want to illustrate kind of what that means for a given ecosystem. So let's take a medium-sized grouper or a mesopredator, which is a mid-level predator from a coral reef. So in the Caribbean, for example, groupers like these have been documented eating smaller fish and even small octopus and cephalopods um, on healthy coral reefs. So those are higher trophic level prey. And so if you pull a mesopredator from a healthy coral reef, it's going to have an increased delta N15 signature, signifying the health of that system. If you pull a mesopredator from a degraded coral reef, it's probably going to be eating lower trophic level prey items because of the lack of biodiversity. So it could be eating shrimp, stomatopods, or herbivorous crabs, and it's going to have a lower delta N15 value in its tissues. So by looking at the nitrogen stable isotopes of a mesopredator, you can track the health of the food web that it came from. And I harness that tool for this project. So stable isotope analysis of museum collections show mesopredator declines in other systems through time. Um, and again, like I said, it's just a mid-level predator. So these studies have found that terrestrial and marine birds have dropped in trophic level over the 20th century. So here's a figure from one of those studies showing the average trophic position of eight seabird species and how they've all declined since 1890. So in 1890, they were at a trophic position of 4.1, and then they dropped to about 3.8. So they've dropped about a third of a food web level in that time. These studies attributed those shifts to commercial fishing and climate change. So I had to think about what species I wanted to use to try to evaluate whether those shifts have happened in New England as well. Um, I would like to introduce you to the two species I picked, which were black sea bass and scup. Um, so both of, these sea, both of these species migrate northward and inshore for summer spawning. Um, black sea bass juveniles eat arthropods, shrimp, and polychaetes, and scup juveniles eat shrimp and small fishes. Black sea bass adults eat fish, and scup adults eat sand glands, anchovies, and crabs. So what made these species perfect for this project? First and foremost, they're commercially important in New England. So I could just sit on the dock and have commercial fishermen come in with their catches and they were very nice and they let me clip pectoral fins for this study, which made my job pretty easy. They're relatively common in museum collections, so there's a lot of them. Um, in museums caught between 1850 and 1950, so I had a big enough sample size of older fish to compare the newer fish to. And finally, they are generalists, so they have a really plastic diet. So their diet is going to reflect the prey options that are around them. So whether they come from a simplified system or a healthier, more complex system, they're going to be eating whatever they can get, and that's going to be reflected in their um, nitrogen isotopes. So my research question was, how have historic destructive fishing methods and overfishing changed the trophic positions of these two common inshore predators? 
So this is a picture of me on the fishing docks in Falmouth, Massachusetts. Like I said, I would just sample fish as they came in. And then I also went to museums to sample older fish. Um, so I went to Harvard, Yale, and the National Museum of Natural History, and they were kind enough to open their doors and let me um, take tiny bits of their specimens for this work. I also sampled modern seaweeds, and then I went into the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and I sampled the herbaria collections there. Um, so I had a total of 60 fish per species and 46 seaweeds. So here are my results. Um, on the x-axis, we have the two time periods, pre-1950 and 2021. And on the y-axis, we have the trophic position of these fish. So I found that black sea bass declined significantly in their trophic positions between these two time periods. And I found the same thing for scup as well. Black sea bass declined almost a full trophic level and scup declined half of the trophic level. But perhaps my most stunning finding was that black sea bass transitioned from a carnivorous to an omnivorous diet in this time because of all of these destructive fishing methods that have been going on. So overall, Massachusetts coastal food webs have been flattened as a result of heavy exploitation and destructive fishing, and similar trophic declines have been documented in other ecosystems. The Northwestern Atlantic has been fished for millennia and we may not have detected all the changes that have occurred. So I really want to emphasize this point because museum specimens only go back to the 1800s and it's very likely that I was already working with an ecologically changed system even at that time. So this sort of puts it into perspective the thousands of years of fishing that have been going on already. I published this work in Ecologia, and if you're interested, uh, feel free to email me and I can send you a PDF. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a bit about a side project um, that came about during my PhD. I was at the Florida Museum of Natural History for projects like the one I just told you about, and this is their curator, Larry Page. And they actually had a bunch of shark vertebrae that were just sitting in jars and they were about to throw them out. And I begged them to let me take them home. And they said, sure. And so I started to look at ontogenetic shifts in trophic ecology for two hammerhead shark species in the Atlantic Ocean. And this is also a great application of stable isotopes. So marine predators mediate important ecosystem processes. They mediate food web structures, species invasions, nutrient cycling, habitat engineering, and frequency of disease. Oceanic sharks are vulnerable to overfishing and they're relatively poorly monitored around the world. There's been an 18-fold increase in fishing pressure worldwide over the past few decades, and this has reduced shark and ray abundance by 71%. Despite sharks' ecological and economic importance, there's not much known about their trophic ecology. So this is really a novel study in terms of the species and the populations that we're looking at. So I was fortunate enough to get samples to look at two species, the scalloped hammerhead and the great hammerhead. So both of these species are large bodied with a tropical cosmopolitan distribution. Um, they have really large ranges, so scalloped hammerheads can travel hundreds of miles and great hammerheads can travel thousands, oh sorry, kilometers, and great hammerheads can travel thousands of kilometers. And unfortunately, they're both listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list. All right, I'm pulling up this pyramid again just to really hammer this point home that Nitrogen stable isotopes are a great tool for measuring how high in a food web an animal is feeding, but I would like to introduce you now to carbon stable isotopes, um, which tell us where uh, in the offshore, inshore part of the water column these species are going. So as you get more and more negative delta C13, um, that's a reflection of being farther offshore. So when we incorporate that isotope into our studies, we can see whether a species is feeding inshore or more offshore. Okay, so 
Like I said, stable isotope analysis of vertebral tissue can be used to assess ontogenetic, or as they get older, changes in diet using nitrogen stable isotopes and habitat using carbon stable isotopes. And um, it's cool because this is laid down yearly like tree rings. So this is a photo I took of a vertebra that I drilled into. Um, and each little powder sample I took from a like the little drill bit is a snapshot into the shark's life as it gets older and what it's been eating and where it's been going. So my research questions were, what trophic roles do these species play in Atlantic food webs and how do those roles shift throughout their ontogeny or as they grow up? In which habitats do these species primarily forage and does this primary habitat change during its ontogeny? And then do either the trophic ecology or habitat preference of these species differ with regards to sex or location? So I had two populations, one from the US South Atlantic and one from the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. So I analyzed nitrogen and carbon stable isotopes from the vertebrae of 27 scalloped hammerheads and 38 great hammerheads. Um, like I said, they were from two different locations and I drilled every three millimeters from the center of the vertebra to the edge. So here are my results for a scalloped hammerhead. I found that delta C13 changes with its vertebral interval, which is indicative of habitat shifts during its life. Specifically, I found that juveniles forage in more pelagic habitats than adults, and this is actually supported by specific studies of this species. For the nitrogen side, I found that delta N15 changes with vertebral interval as well, which is indicative of diet shifts during its life. Um, and they achieve their highest lifetime trophic position as juveniles, which actually also is corroborated by Pacific studies. Um, so when I put these two pieces of information together, I found that as juveniles, they're going into pelagic areas and they're consuming higher trophic level prey. For great hammerhead, I found that delta C13 changes with vertebral interval as well. Um, and specifically that the pups of this species forage in more coastal habitats than adults. Perhaps this is to avoid predation. Oops. And then I found on the nitrogen side that delta N15 actually did not change with its vertebral interval, which is indicative of a pretty constant diet throughout its life. In the interest of time, I will just say that when I compared between the species, Overall, great hammerheads were foraging in more coastal areas and at a lower trophic position than scalloped hammerheads. And I was actually surprised by this because great hammerheads are a lot bigger than scalloped hammerheads. And th there are a lot of exceptions, but typically larger fish feed at higher trophic positions than smaller fish. Um, so I was surprised that they're actually feeding at a lower trophic position and more inshore than scalloped hammerheads. So why does this matter? Well, marine predators like oceanic sharks are declining at alarming rates, and the loss of predators is shifting marine food webs. Understanding the trophic ecology and spatial use of this species helps us to grasp the ramifications of these declines and to conserve more effectively. My next step will be to use compound-specific analysis of amino acids to set a nutrient baseline. And I don't have time to go into that right now, but it's basically another method to set a baseline when seaweeds are not available. So what have we learned? We've learned that food webs are simplifying as a result of multiple human stressors. Preserved seaweeds should be used alongside museum fish specimens to assess trophic ecology of the past. We found trophic declines in a temperate marine ecosystem. And museums are an untapped treasure trove of information about animals' diets, habitats, and food webs of the past. This is me in my natural habitat um, in my office at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. I was lucky enough to do a three-year research fellowship there during my PhD, and I was always surrounded by very old fish. So thank you so much to all of these museums and institutions that helped me along the way. And I will now take any questions. Thank you so much, Madison. I really love that picture of you in the museum. I wish that was my natural habitat too. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> um, audience, we have about five minutes to take questions from you, and we hope you will uh, have lots of them. Um, please type them in the questions chat box, which is located in the, uh, the control panel, and uh, I will be happy to read them to Madison. And while we're waiting for your questions, I want to encourage you to download her slides, which are available in the handouts, um, the handouts menu that's also in the control panel. So let's give this a second. I uh, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much, Madison. Thanks. And of course, I am going to send out the link one more time to our, our uh, YouTube channel because we really want you to share the presentation with those who couldn't join us uh, at 1230 today. So our first question asks, how many samples did you study? Oh my God, um, about 6,000. Wow. Yeah, wow. which is 6,000 um, individual jars to open at the museums and some of them hadn't been opened for 200 years. So that took a little bit of elbow grease. Um, but I got them all open eventually. Can't imagine the smell though, actually. <laughs> yeah. It's um, a very interesting pragmatic question. That was actually for most of those were for a project I didn't share in this presentation, but yeah. We'll wait another minute to see if we get any more questions. Meanwhile, I want to thank um the I want, well, first I want to thank both Alex and Madison, but also Brianna Yancey for the introductions and, and the uh, Fast Lunch and Learn Committee for facilitating this series and making sure that your work is getting out into the world. Um, yeah. So we got two more questions. Uh, the first one asked, where did you do field work? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I was lucky enough to do field work in a lot of cool places. Um, they ranged from French Polynesia to the Australian Museum in Sydney to I even got to go to Curacao with the Smithsonian team and they let me ride in a sub to a thousand feet underwater. So their field work was everywhere and I had a really great time. This next question asks, can you comment on shifting baselines for what makes a healthy food web? Would we define a healthy food web the same way an ecologist from 1950 would? I think the answer to that is absolutely not. So baselines have been shifting there. I love that concept or the term, I guess, of shifting baselines because it really is so true. There's, I actually wrote a blog post about this for the Smithsonian and um, I'd be glad to send it to whoever wants it or emails me later, but basically there have been studies showing how the size of fish like grouper have been slowly getting smaller and smaller and smaller over the last several decades. And we really are dealing with a fundamentally shifted system than we were even in the 1950s. Um, and it's changing as we speak. So shifting baselines is a, is a really important concept. And I would love to chat about that with whoever wants to nerd out after this. I'll be sure to send you the contact information for that question. Um, our last question is, if um, where would you like to see someone build upon this work after you? You know, I, I think museums are incredible. I think that they hold so much information and way more than we usually think about. And I would just love for people to go in there with the curator's permission and do this in like a range of systems. There's so many different areas that have been overfished. There's there's terrestrial areas that have been overexploited and there have been studies using museum specimens to look at this, but definitely not nearly enough. So think of a system that maybe has shifted, get the curator's permission and sample a tiny bit of those specimens and let's just like evaluate which places need our help. I think it's a really powerful tool to look at not only species dynamics, but also the, the a holistic view of the food web. That's a great answer. And uh, apologies, because we actually do have one more question. Uh, this last question says, do you know of any research projects that have since used the preserved seaweed as a method after your study? Yes, my paper was published in 2020, and I believe it has one citation so far. So 
it has helped one person so far. <laughs> Hopefully more to come. <laughs>